Hello everyone, my name is Dorian, CEO of Belfort. Um, I've been with the business for 14 years and um, spent six years before this with the, uh, the mighty Countrywide Estate Agency Group. Um, it's only the second time that we've done one of these uh, sort of retail private client events. And um, in fact, I'll press <coughs> that button so you can see. And um, it's very pleasing. When I walked in this evening, I saw um, a lady walked up and said, oh Dorian, I saw you back in May at the last event and I bought some shares and put them into my ISA. So that was very, very kind. And I think since then we've met one or two new holders who sort of came in after after May. Well, um, there's a slight sort of change to our name as well. I'm wearing a badge that says Belvoir Lettings. We, we changed our name, we listed as Belvoir Lettings um, six years ago. Um, our, our business has sort of changed and evolved over the last six years and we changed our name to Belvoir Group PLC a month ago. The ticker's still the same. That was just a bit of housekeeping more than anything. Um, we also came out with our half year results yesterday. Um, we changed broker for the first time from Cantor Fitzgerald to FinCap. Um, that change happened two months ago. And Cantor have written, FinCap, sorry, have written um, quite an in depth introductory note um, into our business. Um, I believe FinCap are happy to circulate that note. So if anybody doesn't have access to um, their research note, um, if you grab a card from either Louise, my CFO, who's giving away there, um, grab a card from one of us, we'll, we'll happily ensure one of these notes finds its way to you. Um, we haven't sort of put the results into this presentation, so this is a general overview of the business, um, but H1 results very strong, 48% increase in revenue, um, all metrics up, and we made it, we've made a statement to our, our holders, our investors, and to the market to say that um, we're also confident about the second half. So there are a few key messages I'd like to get across um, just before the main sort of presentation. Um, we, we've had, up until the end of 2018, we've had 22 years of unbroken profit and turnover growth. Um, if we hit our numbers this year, which we've said we're, we're confident of achieving, um, that'll be 23 years unbroken profit and turnover growth. Um, we, we're very much a, a yield type stock. Our dividend yield at the minute at the current share price is um, about 6.5%. It was 7% when we put the presentation together, but the share price has lifted by 5% as a result of the, uh, the announcement that we made yesterday. Um, dividend cover, we've been sort of progressively increasing dividend cover. It's, um, it was two in the results, two times in the results yesterday. Um, a full year will be sort of between 1.8 1, 1 and two times cover for the year. And, um, and then lastly, we've committed to a progressive dividend policy. So dividend in H1 is the same as H1 last year, but dividend in H2, there will be a, a sort of modest increase in, um, in the dividend. Um, even though I had an investor say to me two weeks ago, he said, Dorian, your dividend is monstrous. And I kind of took that positively. Um, so, so, you know, I think the market's now a little bit more sensitive to sort of debt. Um, we are looking to bring debt levels down over the next two to three years. This is all mapped out in the FinCap note, by the way, if you, you know, once you read their, their projections. And FinCap have, have kindly put a target price in our share of, um, our share price of £1.90. And we're at, Louise, at the minute, 116, broadly, 117. So, okay. So, who, who and what are we? Um, so first of all, the, um, the business itself. Um, we're a network of 300 letting and estate agency franchises. And I stress the word franchise. Um, some of the corporate estate agency chains, um, Countrywide, LSL, Foxtons, um, haven't been performing very well in, in sort of recent times. And some of the independent agencies, the small one-man bands operating in our sector, again, not great performance but nearly all of the franchise businesses in our sector are performing extremely well. Um, you know, there's a key difference when you've got a franchisee running a business. It's their business, it's their salary, it's their future. Um, they've got absolute skin in the game. They're happy to work seven days a week if they need to. And if the market changes at all, franchisees are very nimble. Um, they, we, we don't um, um, inflict a fixed pricing structure on them so they've got the flexibility to completely change their fee structures in all of the little areas they operate throughout the UK. So we, um, in 2000, at the start of 2015, we had 150 offices. Um, now we're up to 300 um, physical estate and letting agency offices. Um, we're not closing any. Our network isn't going backwards. We're happy with the footprint as it stands at the minute at 300, and that's been stable for three years. Um, what we are doing... Um, 
we, we've increased our, our management service fees. So if you're familiar with franchising, franchisees pay a royalty to a franchisor, and that's normally called management service fees. That's our strong underlying recurring revenue, almost like an annuity stream um, that just increases year on year. Um, over the last four years, we've increased our MSF from the, s the same or similar footprint by around 45% without increasing our fees to franchisees. You know, we, we've committed that we're not going to put our fees up to franchisees and instead we're going to drive more revenue through the, um, through the enlarged distribution network that we've got. So 300 offices. Um, you may or may not have heard of some of these brands, but one of them is Belvoir. Belvoir is primarily a lettings, residential lettings agency <laughs> chain. So 90% of franchisees' revenue is derived from residential lettings. Um, and there may be some landlords in the room. 10% um, of Belvoir's revenue is uh, a state agency. Newton Fallowell is a very strong East Midlands estate agency chain. Um, that's the other way around. So 75% of Newton Fallowell franchisees' revenue is from a state agency, 25% lettings. And Northwood, again, very strong residential letting agency, 90% lettings, 10% um, state agency. Um, Northwood are one of the, in fact, Northwood are the only national chain um, that offers what's called guaranteed rent. If you're a landlord, you may have an insurance policy that guarantees against a tenant not paying their rent. That's not guaranteed rent. Guaranteed rent is primary tenancy. So our franchisees rent the property from the landlord and contract with them. The franchisee then sublets the property to a tenant so the landlord doesn't contract directly with the tenant. Um, it costs the landlord more to have that service, but it appeals to expats who just, you know, for instance, who just want the guaranteed revenue stream, no void period. So even if the property is empty, we continue to pay the rent. And I'd say that's not an insurance scheme. Um, just to give you an idea of, of the scale of that, um, Northwood um, as a franchise network um, is managing about 18,000 properties. 10,000 of those are on guaranteed rent, so it's not a gimmicky type sales proposition. It's genuinely out there being used. Um, after we sort of grew, grew the footprint to 300 offices, we, um, um, in my mind, what, what I want to do long term is, is better control um, the supply chain. You know, a lot of franchisors have, have done this in, the, in their sort of growth. Um, and the first part of that is that we decided to acquire um, a small mortgage company two and a half years ago um, called Brook Financial. Brook is an invisible entity. The actual trading business is Mortgage Advice Bureau. So we, um, again, not to be confused with the wider listed Mortgage Advice Bureau, it's the same brand, um, but, but our, our mortgage advisors trade underneath the Mortgage Advice Bureau banner. If, if you do know Mortgage Advice Bureau, um, they're an umbrella compliance um, um, and mortgage sourcing business. They don't employ any of their own mortgage advisors. All of the mortgage advisors are self-employed and they sit underneath the wider umbrella. So underneath the wider Mortgage Advice Bureau umbrella, um, we're now up to 136 mortgage advisors. MAB have around 1,100 in total. So we represent just over 10% of Mortgage Advice Bureau's advisor network. Um, we finished 2018 with, with 123 advisors. We've grown by net 13 and I've got 13 or 14 um, <laughs> more advisors in the, in the pipeline, which should drop out by the end of the year. So I suspect we'll finish the year with um, around 150 mortgage advisors. And it's traditional whole of market mortgage advice. So hopefully you can see my logic in this. We're, we're, we, we have a network of 300 offices. We've got a huge untapped database of clients who, who a lot of them have mortgages. We've got footfall and um, we're building a network of mortgage advisors to link together with our franchisees so that both the mortgage advisor and the franchisee can offer more services to their, uh, their clients. And us having ownership of the, uh, of the wider mortgage um, side of the business just means we get a cut of the action at the lower level and we get a cut at the higher level because we own the, uh, the top of the supply chain. And you can apply that principle to um, other products and services. Um, I'm very interested in um, training franchisees to get involved in commercial property letting um, on, a, on a smaller scale. I don't mean sort of letting huge buildings on Oxford Street. We're talking sort of small retail units. A lot of our landlord clients have uh, mixed portfolios of residential and commercial, so it makes sense for us to move into that. Um, we're also rolling out um, block management later this year. So again, there's been um, a lot of talk around build to rent, um, these sort of blocks that are big purpose built blocks that are being built. Um, but aside from build to rent, there are lots of apartment blocks in every town in the country 
We've got um, around 2,000 people in our network, sort of franchisees and staff, and um, we've got the boots on the ground to manage blocks at local level and look after maintenance, grounds maintenance, uh, management of the block itself. And of course, then we benefit from sort of the spin-off business, property sales and the property management of the individual individual units. So there's, there's a little map there. I know it's difficult to see, but we, um, we cover pretty much everywhere. Um, in some towns, we have all three brands operating. Um, so Lincoln, where I live, um, we've got very, three very strong <laughs> franchisees. Um, they're not bothered about competing against each other because they do slightly different things, um, <laughs> as I've explained. So um, the markets that we operate in um, are very conscious that everybody has an opinion on property as well because you know we sort of live in them, we, we own property and it usually makes for my quite interesting Q&A. Um, so the letting side first of all, um, in England uh, there are four and a half million households in the PRS. Um, that equates to about 13 million people renting in the UK. Um, the, the tenure of private renting compared with home ownership has been pretty stable for the last three to four years, even though landlords have had to face um, increased taxation, one or two other changes, um, but it certainly hasn't put landlords off. I think um, the increase in stamp duty, which was introduced a couple of years ago, has, has formed a slight barrier to entry in some areas because the deal costs are higher to become a landlord, um, but it certainly hasn't affected us in terms of growth. Um, so 50% um, of landlords use a letting agent. Um, I find this stat completely frightening because you know 50% use a letting agent, the other 50% have no idea about the 150 rules and regulations and um, the, the correct framework of how you should be renting a property and a lot of the horror stories about renting privately are absolutely with landlords who have no idea how to rent a property correctly. Um, so 50% use an agent, 50% don't. Um, the government um, are tightening the regulatory framework around property lettings um, under a lot of pressure from campaign groups. Um, there was a report issued on the 18th of July called the ROPA Report, which stands for Regulation of Property Agents. Um, I wasn't on the working group. It was headed by Lord Best, and it's, I say, a long, pretty dull sort of 55-page document. Um, if you are interested, just read the first page, because that's the summary. Um, and the ROPA Report makes a whole pile of recommendations, all of which I support, um, and it includes mandatory qualifications for people in agency work. You know, why shouldn't a salesperson in, in, in an estate agent have a qualification and be trained on how to do things properly, a formal qualification, when they're dealing with potentially somebody's largest asset? Um, so it's mandatory qualifications, mandatory licensing for both individuals and for firms. You know, if you, if you look at some of the markets, um, um, international markets, you can't, you can't do anything in estate agency or lettings unless you've worked in the industry for two years got a qualification, and in return, the public view estate and letting agents internationally as true professionals. You know, that sort of hasn't happened in the, in the UK yet, but we're, we're, it's certainly on the horizon. Um, the Roper Report also recommends a brand new regulator. Um, you know, I dare I say, similar to the FCA, it won't be quite well funded as the FCA, I doubt, um, but you know, its own regulator and, and, and a few other recommendations. So if you're interested in property or our wider business, it's useful to know what's coming down, down the line. Uh, we're managing 64,650 um, properties. These are mainly residential properties. We do do a bit of block management. We've got a few thousand um, block units under, under management, but primarily it's residential. Um, that's spread across the whole of the UK. Um, the risk from an investor's point of view, the risk is spread. If the market changes in London, um, our exposure within the M25 um, is, is less than um, 7%, so 93% of our revenue is derived from outside of the M25. Um, when we first listed and I did the round of investor meetings, um, the potential investors said, why on earth aren't you in London? We never see you boards around, you know, what's going on, Dorian? Um, now when I do the meetings, they say, thank God you're not in London, Dorian, you know, what a good decision that was. So, you know, and, 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 you, know you sort of can't win sometimes, but, you know, we don't have any exposure to the London market. You know, maybe that's an area that we can sort of grow into in the future. Um, share of target market, I put 3% because um, if there are 4.5 million, let's say 5 million rented properties UK-wide, um, that equates to about 2.5 million um, um, properties that are managed by an agent. So the target market for me is the, the properties that are under management with an agent. 
Um, I suspect that as the regulatory framework tightens up around private landlords, private landlords will think, you know, you don't charge very much, I'll just give you all the hassle and you can take the responsibility of, of looking after properties, but that's sort of maybe two to three years downstream. Um, as I said sort of earlier, we, we're underpinned by management service fees um, that the franchisee pays to us. That is further underpinned by residential lettings. So if a franchisee closed their doors tomorrow, tenants continue to pay rents, we still continue to pay fees. So we're not a sales driven business, if, if, if that makes sense. Um, 80, if you strip out financial services, 80% of franchisees' revenue comes from residential lettings, the, the predictable um, recurring revenue, and 19% um, comes from estate agency. Um, we are sort of growing on the estate agency side. Um, don't believe everything you read in the newspapers. Um, you know, that according to the newspapers, the market's crashed and nobody's selling or buying. Um, we grew our estate agency revenue by 7% last year, and we're forecasting further organic growth on that side. Um, maybe we're just better at it than some of the other agents. Um, on the sales side, we sold um, 6,815 units last year. Um, so not insignificant, that represents 0.6% of all UK transactions. So we feel we can grow that um, significantly. Um, UK property transactions have been falling in the last two years by around 2% a year. Where I get my stats from is that HMRC record every property sale transaction over £40,000, and there kind of isn't anything less than £40,000 anymore. Um, so that they've got some great stats on their website. Um, however, in June and July this year, compared to June and July last year, transaction numbers are down by 10%, and um, I suspect a lot of that um, is down to the, the shenanigans, do I call it? Um, the, 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 the things that are going on you know, around Brexit. You know, if I was a first-time buyer, I, I probably would hold back until at least October, maybe November, before committing to a purchase. And I think, you know, parents will be telling their children that. Um, so I suspect that's a, a temporary dip. Um, we're not phased if property transactions do fall. Um, we've been through this before. So in 2009, 10, 11, property transactions fell from 1.2 million to about 600,000. They're halved in real terms. Because if property prices start to fall, vendors don't suddenly think, I'm going to sell and cash in. They just hold the property and ride the storm. So that's why the number of transactions fell um, so much in 2009, 10, 11. Um, why I'm not phased by that is that we're primarily still a lettings business. And what typically happens when the, sa the sales market takes a, a, a fall, um, vendors turn into landlords, they keep their properties, and buyers hold back and become tenants in that intervening period. So the letting side of the business did extremely well during the, uh, the last sort of property downturn. So again, we're not faced by that. Um, house price inflation doesn't particularly impact us whether prices are going up or down, not, not in, a, in a, um, any, any sort of significant way. Um, house price inflation 0.9%, um, down in some areas, up in other areas, such as the, uh, you know, such as the market. Um, I've mentioned that 7%, um, we increased our property sales by 7% um, in, in, um, in H1. And I've put sort of online agents on there. Um, again, a lot of sort of noise around online agents, but in my mind, they're, um, they're about 95% of the noise and about 5% of the transactions. They've put a load of money into um, um, a marketing of their proposition and they've managed to grab less than sort of 10% market share after sinking in the best part of a billion pounds into marketing. You know, what could we have done with a billion pounds? Certainly a lot more than that. So, um, so the future really, we're looking to diversify further, as I've mentioned, into, um, into new income streams. I've mentioned the professionalisation of the sector. Um, I'll happily answer anything else in sort of Q&A. Um, we are continually expanding our footprint, not, not necessarily the number of physical offices, but we're certainly growing the business year on year. And, um, and the sector is consolidating. It's, a, it's an unusual sector where the majority of, of estate and letting agents are still single office operators. So the way the, the market is, is going is that the corporates are struggling for lots of reasons. Um, the independent agents, a lot of them are selling up and we're buying them. You know, our franchisees are acquiring them. Um, and the sort of middle of the market, the franchisee-driven market, and bear in mind, you know, the Purple Bricks model, they're, they're LPEs, they're local property <coughs> experts, are self-employed individuals, they're not employees. So the sort of self-driven, franchisee-driven um, business models are all performing generally well. 
um, and, and why invest. Um, I've only got one minute to talk about this, even though I could talk about this for about an hour. Um, so lots of reasons, but t 22 years of unbroken sort of profit and turnover growth. Um, you know, we, we haven't missed a step on the dividends since we listed. Um, we have also um, committed to a progressive dividend policy. As I say, the, um, the dividend in H2 will be higher than... Um, in H2 last year. Um, we've sort of been measured about that because we know that our dividend is already, you know, very strong. Um, you know, it's good returns. It's, it, you know, it's, it's been safe and secure, certainly up until now. And, um, but we're just looking to sort of um, maybe sort of build up our cash reserves um, somewhat um, to satisfy some investors. But, um, but ultimately, you know, we're very confident about the second half and um, have a look at FinCap's forecast, you know, for the next, next three years. But, you know, good, solid business model. Um, we've put, this is not for me, um, we've put um, all the sort of um, facts and figures into the presentation. Um, Louise, my CFO, is also here if you want to fire any questions at her. If I'm not mistaken, am I at the end of the presentation part? Yes. What, um, what does the franchisee get, for, um, you know, rather than being an independent agent, wh why become a franchisee at Belvoir? Yep, no problem. Um, I'm still on. Um, they, they get all sorts. I mean, they, they get discounts with key suppliers um, such as Rightmove. Um, and, you know, if you followed Rightmove over the last few years, um, Rightmove have increased their charges to agents tenfold um, in the last few years. You know, they, they just keep putting fees up. And they're sort of, um, for every pound Rightmove generates, they're sort of passing 75 pence, you know, or 80 pence back to you. Um, so we get significant discounts with suppliers because of scale. Um, they get training, support, website. IT security um, and, and, and access to initiatives like assisted acquisitions. So this is now this is very profitable for us and the franchisee. So last year we helped our franchisees buy in by acquisition 6.9 million of, of extra revenue, and we've got an in-house acquisitions team um, who goes out looks for a suitable acquisition of a small independent letting agency, um, approaches the target. Well, they may, may approach 10 targets until we find you know the right one. And then we work with the franchisee to help them buy that business. So then longer term, we get the MSF benefit. The franchisee gets the benefit of a book without the cost of operating a second unit because they bring them all together. And we help fund some of these deals. Um, of the 6.9 million last year, um, we loaned to franchisees about 400,000, I think, if memory serves, on, on the 600. So we lend a relatively small amount. We've got a lot of security against that because ultimately in our franchise model, if, um, if we decide to terminate a franchisee, if they behave badly, which doesn't happen often but could do, um, and we terminate, um, we own the goodwill of that business. Um, we don't own the trade and assets, it's just the goodwill. And the goodwill is the lettings book, that's where the real value is. So that then refers back to us as the franchisor. Um, so needless to say, we don't have franchisees defaulting on these loans. You know, we're the last on the, last on the list. Um, we, we came to the market and raised five million in 2013 um, to, to use for franchisee loans. And that five million has worked incredibly hard. So last year, from the 6.9 million of franchisee revenue, that's worth to us as a business 600,000 600, a year recurring for the life of those clients. So very profitable. No cost to offset against that. So we're going to do as many as we possibly can. Um, and that 5 million, we, haven't, we, we sort of deployed the whole 5 million. It, it's then paid off over a relatively short period, and we just keep redeploying it. And the current loan book stands at about 3.9 million. So, yeah. um, thank you. A quick question. Some of our politicians have mooted something about rent caps. Do you have a view on such political meddling? That's, that's actually a good way of describing it. That's certainly one way of describing it. Um, and actually, it gets worse than that, that there are... Um, I've, I've heard, in my 20 years in property, I've heard some weird and wonderful ideas of <clears throat> how to, in their words, address a broken housing market. And, and I think, you know, you, you've got to first off think, is the housing market broken, you know, and define broken? Um, our property, you know, is it because property prices are too high? Um, I think it's more so that we're just not building enough social housing, therefore... Um, th there's a big push for landlords to house people on benefits. We're now lo no longer as agents from this year um, allowed to put no DSS into advertising on the main portals. Um, and, and the portals and the campaign groups don't care that buy-to-let lenders say you can't rent to housing benefit tenants in the T's and C's if you buy-to-let more because you put hey-ho, um, you know, things I'm sure will change. Um, so, you know, t to me... Um, 
addressing the sort of broken housing market, if it is broken, it should be about building social housing. 1.5 million people on council house waiting lists. Um, thanks to Right to Buy, which I'll come on to in a second, because that's the more recent sort of weird and wonderful idea. Um, you know, thanks to Right to Buy, 6 million council houses are now down to, what, 2.5 million? And they haven't been replaced on a like-for-like -like basis. Um, we're building about 15,000 social housing units a year. Um, Sadiq Khan committed to building um, a whole tranche, and I think he managed to some total of zero in his first year. Um, you know, a great result. So, so you can, my point being that landlords and the PRS are, are being pushed to house tenants that actually the PRS was never intended for. The PRS was meant to be for the mobile workforce, you know, give a solution if someone wants to keep a property long term. All sorts of reasons. First time buyers before they become first time buyers, you know, that's what the PRS is for. But it's sort of come under pressure, um, um, I guess more social reasons um, than anything else. Um, so rent caps are generally used in, in city centres. You know, if you look at how rent caps are applied, um, they're not used in the UK, but they are used internationally in some areas. Um, it's normally in very concentrated areas where rent rises have been particularly aggressive. Um, rents have been rising across the UK by between 1% and 2% for the last five years. That's not aggressive. <laughs> Pockets of London may be aggressive, but there aren't really anywhere, any other areas in the UK where that's applicable. So I think that's more a sound bite to appeal to 13 million, dare I say it, renters, you know, um, rather than a meaningful policy. And, and you know, another, another bizarre one sort of in the last two weeks is, so bear in mind what I said about the loss of, of council houses. And, and that policy has resulted in, in a vast shortage of social housing. Why then would you apply that to the PRS? <laughs> you know, and, and I mean, I've got a holiday home on the East Coast that I rent out. You know, I've agreed to rent out for two or three years. And I love this. It's a little bungalow on the East Coast. It's lovely. And, and, and uh, I wasn't using it as a holiday home. I decided to rent it for a couple of years. Uh, if, if there was any sniff that I, I would be made to sell that property to my tenant, I'd ask the tenant to leave, I'd leave the property vacant, and ultimately that person wouldn't have anywhere to live. You know, with 13 million people renting, I think government make a lot of noise around the housing sector, but n no party has tackled the housing market for, for at all, full stop. There have been lots of interventions, none of them have made any particular difference apart from possibly pushing house prices up. Um, help to buy, you know, that was heralded as a great way to get people on the property market. Property prices have increased by 53% during the period of help to buy. Good initiative or not, I don't know. <laughs> Dorian, if I was a single op operator, uh, state agent, letting agent, yep. say in a provincial town, yep. what would it cost me to, to um, go with you as a franchise E? Yeah. Well, um, not a great deal apart from ShopFit to join. So, you know, there wouldn't be any upfront cost as such. The biggest cost is the, um, is the ongoing royalty that I mentioned, management service fee. Um, so depending on which network you join, there are, diff two diff there are two different rates, and these are legacy issues. So Newton Fallowell and North would charge 10% of gross revenue, um, and Belfort franchisees pay 12%. And, you know, I genuinely feel that franchisees look at their MSF, which is not insignificant, you know, it's a fair chunk of their revenue, but I, I, I believe that they, they value that and they get value for it, and if they weren't getting value for it, they just go <laughs> and, and do something else. Um, so yes, that's, that's the upfront cost. Um, sorry. Uh, sorry, uh, do any of them, or have you ever considered a model where there's sort of like a fixed fee for some of your revenue and yeah. maybe a lower percentage for the franchise fee, on, on lower percentage of turnover? Yeah, I mean, some, some, franchise, for, for some franchisors do do that, but in my experience, it can limit the success of the franchisor longer term. I mean, there are some models, Finer Country is a good example, if you've come across sort of Finer Country brand. Um, they operate, that is a franchise model, it's a license, they call it a license model, but it's franchising. Um, they charge their franchisees a fixed fee, um, but which means that they're insulated against the ups and downs of, of the market, if you like. Um, but it also restricts the growth of the franchise. Or, you know, just to give an example of that, when um, when when the Goddards first started Balfour, they left the forces. Mike was a wing commander. Um, Stephanie Goddard was sort of XMOD. Their aspiration for Belvoir was to have 60 franchisees, all of them managing 60 properties, that was it. So if they'd have applied a fixed fee at that level, you know, the business, I wouldn't be standing here, you know, the business would be restricted. So, um, no, I think a, a percentage to me is equitable. It gives the franchisor 
adequate incentive to help the franchisee grow and, um, and the franchisee doesn't have an issue. You know, when some franchisees are paying us 12% of a million pounds now um, and they're not complaining, you know, I've got probably the best relationship with the bigger franchisees compared with, you know, the smaller ones. Maybe it's because I don't go and see the smaller ones. But, um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you mentioned at the start that you've just kind of started doing this sort of presentation. Um, yeah. Could you give us a view on your current uh, shareholder base? Um, who, who owns the shares at the moment? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're um, um, the, the founder has sort of sold down over the over the years, and if memory serves, he's down to about five and a half million shares um, there or thereabouts. Um, so he is still the the largest shareholder. Uh, Mike stood down as chairman in May this year, and we appointed um, Michael Stoop, who's the ex, who is next Winkworth director, ex managing director of TPFG and one of our competitors and um, 40 years experience great guy and, and the founder retired and went so founders in his 70s um, so the rest of the um, we're mainly institutional investors we don't have much retail but there is you know some retail again if memory serves I think we sort of 18 19 percent retail the rest is is either founder with a relatively small number now and, uh, and its institutions and if you have a look at our shareholder list I mean it's um, it's Mighton, um, Blackrock, Lion Trust, Killick, um, Kestrel, um, you know we've got a pretty strong institutional shareholder list and you know when we've had investor meetings when they've looked at the the list they, they say you know it's a it's one of the best of the of the institutions really I think the next step for us in my mind um, I want to see the business worth <coughs> you know with a market cap of around 100 million we know that we've got to get to over 50 million to appeal to a new a new set of, of sort of fund managers and that to me is the next step and then beyond that um, you know we shall see Dorian, thank you very much indeed. Brilliant. That's great. That's great.